Welcome. Hello, everyone. Yes, it's me live. Not pre recorded, but live. It is Saturday, February 2nd, 2019. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you being here every time. I'm glad to be back with you live. Been busy uh, last weekend, and uh, we went to uh, interview Mark Gemini Thwaites at the Bauhaus Peter Murphy concert, and uh, we had a great time, and we had a great interview, and we've released some photos, but we'll be releasing more material on that, and uh, be looking for that interview because it's really a good one, and uh, it's very informative, so um, please keep an eye out for that one. Um, I do want to apologize for not being here last night. I'm going to get too far into this, but um, I have a, uh, a medical condition that sometimes I get sick in the evenings and sometimes, unfortunately, it's very close to showtime. And that happened uh, to me last night. So my apologies to William Pullen. Uh, we will have him back on. We have an excellent topic to talk with him about. And uh, I just want you to know uh, that I appreciate all of you viewers and uh, if uh, something happens like that where I'm not here live, uh, if, I, if you've seen me on social media that day and I'm talking about the show and suddenly I'm not there, it, it probably means that I'm not feeling well. Uh, th this will pass. Uh, I'm probably going to have surgery uh, later this year and, and that will fix that. But, but just know that if I'm not uh, here consistently in the evening at that time, that it probably means that I'm just really under the weather and uh, it's very difficult for me to fight. So um, uh, just, just accept that as my apology. And my apologies to William Poland. We'll have him back on. He's a great friend and he's an awesome researcher. So um, we will come back around to all that. Thank you for your patience. Um, I did travel out of town today. I just want to show you this artifact. Well, I wouldn't call it an artifact. That might, it's an object. And um, uh, I went down to Tucson today and uh, there's a uh, rock and mineral show that happens every year down in Tucson and it's huge and it happens in multiple venues and uh, there's a wide uh, variety of objects and things. Uh, I thought it would be mostly uh, rock and gem type stuff, but there was a lot of Nepalese uh, items there and uh, a lot of um, Hindu things and a lot of Tibetan objects. And I had seen something like this before, but I didn't quite know what it was. And I'd never seen so many of them in one place. And, and I, I wanna show this to you, I'm gonna hold it up. I'll, I'll post some pictures of this on, me, on social media. And uh, in, uh, this is called a Kila or um, a Purba, and that is spelled P-H-U-R-B-A. And uh, this is solid metal. It feels very heavy. No, it's not sharp. And um, this is used in Tibetan ceremonies to uh, not only uh, help uh, focus uh, someone in meditation, but uh, this also uh, reputedly wards off um, evil spirits. Uh, it can uh, ward off or uh, hold a demon, uh, according to Wikipedia. Uh, as you know, I'm not so much on the woo-woo side of things. I'm a little more nuts and bolts most of the time. But uh, that's within the Tibetan mythology, uh, that's where this object falls in line. And uh, so this is uh, a really, uh, according to Tibetan mythology, a, a very powerful object, a very powerful object in their ceremonies. And uh, I can't help but look at it, it's so heavy. But um, if you wanna see some close-up pictures of it, uh, take a look at my Facebook page and uh, check that out. It's, uh, it's really interesting. Maybe we'll get more into that. Uh, I'm going to look for someone to come on and maybe we can uh, discuss that. But uh, I want to get around to tonight's guest because I appreciate this gentleman's time so much. I would be shocked if you're watching this show and you don't know who he is. His name is Grant Cameron, and I'm just going to tick off a few of the uh, book titles that he has. Uh, and it's not even the subtitles of these books, but uh, Charlie Red Star. Uh, Managing Magic, uh, Tuned In, The Paranormal World of Music. Um, he hails from Winnipeg, Manitoba, uh, Canada, and uh, he's very well known for his document work in the past with uh, Presidential Archives, 
and especially uh, Clinton administration era um, documents. And uh, he had a consciousness experience in more recent years. And uh, we're going to talk about that. And we're going to talk about how that affected his work. And uh, I'd like to welcome to the show. Thank you very much for being here, Mr. Grant Cameron. Well, Thank thanks you. for having me on. I, I really appreciate your interest in what I'm doing. And uh, hopefully your listeners can learn one or two little new things tonight. Absolutely. No, that's that's what this is all about. We like to provoke thought. We like to get people thinking. And uh, we like to present a new angle or a different angle on uh, topics. And of course, um, you have your uh, show on KGRA, but you do so much work uh, beyond just having that radio show. You make a lot of appearances. And um, I'd, I'd like to just kind of jump right in. Can we talk about how you had this shift from the kind of nuts and bolts ufology that you were researching in the past and this experience that you had with consciousness, which totally changed the focus of your work? Okay, so it goes back to 1975. I have uh, five close-up sightings in two years. I think I've sort of discovered the sort of, uh, I'm going to solve this, make a million dollars. Nobody cares. Nobody wants to publish the book about this town. Um, all I'm interested then is the one publisher said to me, Mr. Cameron, you may believe in this kind of stuff. Count me among the unbelievers. And I was shocked. So all I was interested then is somebody must know what I had seen. And I started this pursuit of trying to find the most powerful person in the world to find out what this is all about. So I chased the Canadian government for a number of years, gathered all the material that they had done in the early 1950s. Then I chased the former president of Penn State University around for eight years. He knew what was going on, tried to get him to explain. And then he led to the, he's going to put some of his files at the, um, the Truman Library. And that's when I went to the Truman Library and was there. And then um, I couldn't find the Walker files. And then I, so then I said, well, this is the most powerful guy in the world. He must know what's going on. So I said, well, what, what have you got on UFOs and the president? What, what kind of documents? And they basically only had a couple of pages. I went down the road to the Eisenhower library, which is only a couple hours down the road. And they had five pages and I said, well, or five documents. And I said, well, how many pages are there in the Eisenhower uh, library? And they said 28 million pages. And I went, what? And I sort of figured like something's going on. So I started this pursuit of racing from library to library, gathering all the presidential um, material that I could, all the stories about the presidents, tried to interview. I did have my couple seconds of fame talking to Dick Cheney at one point. Uh, but that was all. I was going there and it was sort of like, yeah, it appears the president knows. They, they all are dealing with this, but they're never going to tell you. And it was sort of like a sort of a dead end road, which I didn't realize till after I had my download experience. But it was February 26, 2012. I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. I'm watching a lecture given by Colin Andrews, who's the famous crop circle guy who came up with the term crop circle. Uh, it was a uh, what I call now contact modality. I was in the room. Um, I didn't want to be in the room. I wasn't interested in crop circles. All I went in there for was because Colin Andrews was a prominent researcher and I figured I should pay him the respect and go watch his lecture. So I'm sitting in the lecture, I'm zoning out, I'm thinking about going across the river to Laughlin, Laughlin, Nevada, or no, this was in, this was in Laughlin, it wasn't in Phoenix, it was in Laughlin. And, and so I decided, uh, well, I'll just stay here. And then all of a sudden he was talking about consciousness and crop circles. And his theory was that 20% are real, they're done by whatever intelligence it is, and the other 80% are hoaxed. And they're also done by the intelligence. The intelligence is dictating to the people um, hoaxing the crop circles what to put down. And that was basically the theme of the lecture. But during that lecture, it happened instantaneously. It happened with absolute certainty. It was just suddenly three pieces of a puzzle were stuck into my head. And they were things that I had researched. This was nothing new. They were mm -hmm. pieces that I had gathered over the years. It put the three pieces together and said, it's all about consciousness. And it suddenly it's like, oh, that's how it works. And it was like for two days, I was just, I was in heaven. I was walking around. I thought, wow, I figured this thing out. And from that period of time, from February of 2012 till now, I have really spent almost all my time on the consciousness subject. And it's almost like I've got glasses on. I can see the street signs. I can read everything. Everything starts to make sense. And so that's been my pursuit since 2012. That's how I, and a lot of people said they couldn't believe that I, who I was sort of like the, sort of the king of the documents that I, one, one famous um, 
reporter had asked me, he said, I can't believe you've done this, Grant. I can't believe you went from um, the uh, government documents to the woo-woo side. And I said, it was Jerry Pippen. And I said, well, Jerry, I'll tell you what. You know, I, I really didn't plan to go there. I was kind of teleported there. And it was true. Mm -hmm. I mean, it happened to me. Uh, most of the things that happened in my career happened by things I didn't want. Like, I didn't want to see a UFO sighting in 1975. I only went out to this town because other people were seeing it. I had no interest in UFOs. I had no interest in a download experience. And I had another download experience, very dramatic one, very lengthy one, about maybe 15 months ago. And, and I didn't intend that either. So most of the things that have happened to me are things that I didn't intend to happen. And I've sort of learned how to sort of, when you get that gut feeling, like, you know, maybe I should uh, go down this road. And the latest one actually just happened. Uh, actually, it was in um, Laughlin and then in Tucson, this event that happened in November with the ports where I got into this, this whole subject of ports where I sort of got dragged into this thing. And suddenly all this stuff is happening around me. And it's almost like you're, you're in the wizard of Oz for a couple of days. And then you pop back out and say, wow, that was, that was really strange. So that's been my career is just being dragged down one rabbit hole after another. And, uh, I don't really, you know, um, regret leaving the document thing. The, the government knows the president knows they're not going to tell you. And I say, you've got to get into, Consciousness and the other key thing I say that you have to look at is you've got to talk to experiencers. You have to talk to people who are interacting with the consciousness, with the phenomena, with the intelligence behind the phenomena. You can look at all the videos you want in the world. You can look at all the metal you want in the world. You can look at all the UFO sightings. You will never, ever, I say, never, ever solve the problem until you talk consciousness and you talk to people who are actually interacting with the intelligence and find out what they're being told. I would have to say that my official perspective on this would be that uh, we need to listen to you when you say this, because I think your background with the nuts and bolts stuff and the documents kind of gave you that legitimacy that you weren't doing the woo woo stuff that you were dealing with um, more evidence or evidence based um, research. And then you made this shift and I want to really focus in on this, and I really want to help people understand what this experience is like for you. I myself had a, I'm not going to get into it, but I had a, a certain experience in an altered state of consciousness. Uh, I saw visions. Um, I perceived uh, words, information that was, it was kind of like my thoughts were being typed into my head. Like they did wow. not originate from me. They came from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not like I heard a voice. I, I, it would be uh, incorrect to say that I heard like a separate uh, voice, but it was like my thoughts were coming from somewhere else. And, and can we talk in detail about what this experience is like for you? And is, is this akin to remote viewing or is this uh, qualitatively different? Well, the way I would describe it is like an aha moment, but a little more dramatic. The, the, the thing that I always impress upon people is the idea of the absolute certainty. It's almost like when you see a UFO, if you haven't seen a UFO, you can either believe or disbelieve. You can only know if you've seen it. Only the people who see it know what's going on. And um, so when it came with this absolute certainty, um, that was what really sort of blew me away because I have had very few sort of paranormal experiences. I had the UFO experience. And when I saw that, I just went like, wow, this actually is for real. I couldn't, I couldn't, I had nothing. So when you have had no paranormal experiences and then suddenly have one, and then when you, I did the government document stuff, then when I sort of fell off the, the, the cliff there with the, the consciousness experience, that's where everybody said, well, well, if Cameron had it, there must, maybe there's something to it. It's just, cause I was never into it. And, and I've only had three sort of major download experiences and the UFO sightings, but I have not had anything else. I haven't talked to an alien. I haven't had any other weird things. So when you have these things that happen in, in the middle of nothing for years and years and years, it sort of just blows you away. And what I would describe in the first one was it happened instantaneously. The second one, and, and as you, you know, I, I live in a very cold area. This is in the fall of 2016. I'm walking downtown and that's how I sort of uh, dissociate. And, and all of paranormal, all the, what I call contact modalities have to do with disassociation. It's the ability to shut down your left rational analytical brain, the little voice, shut it off. 
whether it's hypnosis, psychedelics, uh, you know, meditation, whatever technique you're using to shut that down. And so I walk and, and it's not that I am intending it to do it, but I was doing a long walk going downtown and I was just had left McDonald's and I'm just walking. And then it happened almost like 2012. I could feel it. It was like different, a different feeling. It was like, Oh, it's coming. This is not me. This is something coming in. And so I took my, I, there was a bunch of stuff. And the second one was a download, which said the reason sort of like the way to figure out what's going on in the world is it's like a mathematical equation. If you add in step number one, instead of subtracting, you can do all the calculations after that you want, you are not going to get the right answer. You have to do the right steps at the right time. And so it was this sort of a, there was 24 things that came and they were things like, is the world made out of nuts and bolts? That's one world. Right. But if it's made out of consciousness, if that's primary, it's a completely different world. You have to rethink everything. Almost like, is it one life? If it's one life, then it's one world. But if it's multiple lives, reincarnations of fact, everything changes. Is it a random world? If it's a random world, it's one world. But if it's self-organizing the, the, the universe, it's a different world. You got to rethink everything. So these 24 things were coming and I knew it was coming. And uh, I said, I got to write this down because I know I'm going to forget this if I don't write it down. So I took off my glove and it was very cold and I started to write these points down and I got about maybe 18 of them and then it sort of stopped. And then I, I put my glove back on and I kept walking and then some more started coming and then I got my glove off and I wrote some more down and I recorded all these and eventually I'll do a, a book on these 24 things that came. But it's that sort of thing where you go by a feeling where, or, or I can wake up in the morning. The third one I had was only a couple, a couple days ago. Uh, I wake up in the morning all right, I wake up at about 1 30 in the morning. I can't sleep, but I don't want to get out of bed. So I'm lying there and I'm going, I should get up and meditate. I have this, this meditation headband, uh, uh, thing that I use and I can meditate for 10 minutes and then I go back to bed and I'll fall asleep. But if I don't do the meditation, I, I'll be awake for hours. So I'm going, Oh, I don't want to get out of bed and meditate. And I'm just lying there. And all of a sudden I realized like, I'm not really, I'm not really awake and I'm not really asleep. I'm in this hypnotic state and I go, mm -hmm. This is where you learn. So I, I had this lecture and this, this thing that I'm working, the main thing I'm working on right now is a thing called contact modalities. So I'm doing this, this, these, I'm taking these slides and I'm putting them into my head. I'm saying, what about this slide? And it was like clear as day. Oh, it means this, this, this. And I'm, I'm sitting there, I'm trying to remember all this stuff and I'll put the next slide in and it was as clear as day. But then what happens is once, once I woke up, I wrote some of the stuff down. But once I wrote, got up and I would, you'd read your writing, almost like when you have a dream and you read the writing and you go like, what the hell was I thinking? Like, I don't know what this means. Like you wrote it down, but you didn't, you didn't, you know, write enough about it. You just put it in point form and thinking you would, you would, uh, you would, you would get it. So that's basically what the, what the thing is like. And, and what I learned later on is that you have things like uh, the, the experiencers, you have the, the survey. Hello? Wow. He's gone. He is completely gone. I'm going to lean on the professor to uh, reestablish contact. He, wow. You know what? I, I'm going to, when this stuff happens, like a lot of times I felt like when this stuff happens on coast to coast, that it's like a put on, right? Like they'll be talking to someone all of a sudden the line goes dead or uh, there is some kind of interference or interruption. And, and there have been times when I was like, come on, man, they're just, you know, they're, they're trying to create some drama and they're doing this. This is not the first time that a guest has just disappeared off this show with their uh, feed directly interrupted. And uh, I, I, I promise you, this is absolutely sincere. You just saw it happen. He was talking and, you know, sometimes like if someone's, uh, feed uh, kind of freezes or there's a latency problem in the signal. Like I can see them freeze up and kind of stop. And then the latency uh, kind of catches up with itself and then, and then they're back on. And, but he just disappeared like someone waved a magic wand and uh, it's incredible. But what I'll continue to do is I'm going to continue to roll with this and uh sing and dance for you uh metaphorically speaking and see if we can't get mr cameron back on i've been waiting i have been waiting months to have grant cameron on this show 
And, uh, and oh, there he is. Oh my God, that's great. I don't know what wow. happened there. It just uh, the browser collapsed, whatever that means. I don't know. The browser yeah. shut down. But... That means anyway, the NSA so we... doesn't like what you're saying. <laughs> Yeah, well, we'll 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 get into what we can, and if we have to do it again, we'll do it again. I can. Oh no, no, it. we're we're still rolling live, man. Yeah, we're good okay. to go. Okay, so that that's basically the and what I found out with the experiencer survey with six thousand experiencers is forty two percent of all experiencers claim that they have mathematical, technical, or scientific material in their head that they did not learn in school. Forty percent of all experiencers say at one point during their experience they knew the answer to everything in the universe, and so because of this, I got into this this contact modality is learning to make contact is that the conscious mind isn't, isn't learning anything. If you can get out of the conscious mind and get into the field, you can pull this down this material down and people will say, well, you know, experiences that just believe they're having experiences. I say, I don't care if you give them lie detectors, whatever, but don't ignore them. These people may have the answer to the biggest problems of the world they're, they're and they will tell you unlike the government the government won't tell you what's going on but experiences will tell you the messages that they've gotten and they have some pretty dramatic messages yeah um this is this is fascinating and it's it's layered and i would like to kind of peel away at least what what in my mind is kind of like the first layer or yeah. the first question to get into this and that is do you feel like and 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 i i i kind of use air quotes for this do you feel like in terms of consciousness that this alien intelligence is transmitting to us for us to hear them or do you think that your consciousness became more attuned so that maybe more like a radio receiver suddenly you were able to just receive a signal that was there you know all along he's gone again <laughs> Wow. He'll be back. He's quick. He, uh, one thing I can say about Mr. Cameron is that uh, he's an experienced broadcaster and uh, he recovered much more quickly than anyone else that's ever disappeared. <laughs> well, that, that's a trip, man. That's a trip. Uh, I don't quite know what to say about that. Although I, I love what he's saying, man. Uh, it's uh let me check my messages. Um, I got the professor. Um, I'm sure that the professor is working diligently right now. So let me take a look and see who's in the chat room. Let's do that. Hi, Sherry. I hope things are going well. Uh, Ray, uh, Ray Daw. Uh, hello. How are you? Uh, future creations out of mind. Uh, of course, uh, the adversary. Wow. Uh, ask Grant what he thinks of Ron Pandolfi's man bun. <laughs> what do you think of Ron Pandolfi's man bun? I'll ask him if Mr. Cameron uh, makes it back. I'll ask. Um, out of mind, uh, Packenack Lake. Hi. Jason uh, Goldthorpe. These are some new uh, people. I don't know if you're new subscribers or new watchers or you're here um, because of uh, Grant Cameron, which which is fine. Uh, he certainly has a following of his own. And um, let's see, you know, um, I'm, I'm wondering if, I, I guess uh, some of the deeper elements of his work, and I don't want to, talk out of school and, and say something that uh, is incorrect. And I certainly do not speak for Mr. Cameron, but uh, as I understand it, and what we're trying to get into here is that um, he has had conscious experience or knows of other people that have had conscious experience of uh, the inside of alien craft and actually operating alien craft. And uh, part of what I want to ask him is if he thinks that this link of consciousness that uh, exists perhaps throughout the uh, whole universe, which, you know, that sounds kind of vague, but um, I, I, I do want to refer back to my conversation with Alan Steinfeld, where we talked about a thread of consciousness that kind of uh, is manifest throughout all the levels of reality or the multiverse or universe, however you want to phrase that, um, that there's a thread of consciousness that goes through all that, that kind of 
uh, can be tapped into or accessed. And uh, that, that thread of consciousness throughout all of reality um, is, in a certain sense, through that consciousness, the, the key to what might be called in Buddhism, the oneness of everything. And um, that, that perhaps, I just thought of this, maybe that's a part of what we might think of as a unified field theory. Maybe one key element of unified field theory is that it's consciousness and not necessarily pure physics. Mr. Cameron, I see you're back. Welcome back. Yes. Well, hopefully we can stay a little bit longer this time. It's like a yeah. bizarre. bizarre. Yeah, okay. yeah, no. I keep Go talking, but I no, this is all about you. So uh, if you know where you left off, please continue. Oh, you were going to ask a question. You were going to parse back. A, a I, I was. Here. Oh, that's yeah. right. That's right. I was asking you um, if... Uh, this, if you feel like they are uh, reaching out to people and this is more like a transmission and they're kind of like, like I don't want to say invasive because that has a negative connotation, no. but um, I know what you're or, saying. Or, yeah. or where they kind of push themselves on you. And once again, not in a negative way or whether your consciousness opened up more like a radio receiver yeah. and suddenly your conscious awareness was able to make contact or as you say, uh, a, as a contact modality to suddenly perceive what's going on with them. Yeah. What's your theory? Um, what, what, one, of the, one of the parts of the download I got, is it external or is it internal? So the way we basically see the world today is we say, you know, um, you know um, I'm not having a good day because uh, what Donald Trump is doing, Hillary Clinton did her emails, the dog ate my <laughs> homework. And we go through this whole rendition of, we believe that every, everything that happens, uh, that we are like a cork sort of floating down the river and everything that's happening around us makes us happy, sad, successful, unsuccessful, all sort of stuff. And I believe it's internal. And that was what I was basically told in this download experience was that no, it's everything. So I would say you're a, send, you're a receiver. Everything is in the field. So whether it's ghosts, UFO, aliens, uh, higher self, whatever. It's in the field. And it, so it all comes down to dissociation and particularly trauma. So you have people with a traumatic events who, for example, Edgar Casey's a prime example. Edgar yes. Casey's a young kid. He can't spell. His father's getting upset. He's got the spelling book. And then his father hits him across the head and knocks him flying off the chair onto the floor. He's lying on the floor with the book. And he suddenly gets this, this vision of this angel who says, rest for a minute and we will help you. And he, put, he said, daddy, let me put my head on the book. He puts his head on the book. He wakes up and he can memorize at that point for the rest of his life. He can put his head on a book and memorize anything that's in the book. The second event that he had was he got hit with a baseball. And that was the one where he started to channel and he started to doing the, we see the body, you know, all these healing stuff. So you have these right. trauma events that people would say, oh, it's horrible. It's, you know, this happened, but it's the trauma events that sort of force you to dissociate and you pop into the field. So most mediums, a lot of mediums have childhood abuse issues. And so they're trying to get out of the world. They're trying to dissociate. They're trying to shut out the world. And all of a sudden, boom, they're talking to their dead grandmother, multiple personality people who I'm, I'm very interested in, people who have very bizarre abilities like, uh, multiple personality. One of their personalities may speak a different a different language that they've never heard before. Uh, one will have cancer. One of the alters won't have cancer. One will have diabetes. One won't. And you have these bizarre things. And again, this is dissociation, or it's so it's a, the ability to shut down the left rational analytical brain. And there's even experiments that were done. There was one done. One of the most fascinating subjects in the world is savants. If you want to learn consciousness, these savants were yes. able to do. Cal calendar calculation, you say to them in the next 10,000 years, how many years are going to be uh, um, Easter on April the 3rd? And they'll go this day, year, and they'll name all the years off and stuff like that. So you wonder where they're getting this from. One of the talents that, that savants have, that some of the savants have, is you can take the famous one in Rain Man was you drop the, the toothpicks. And as the toothpicks hit the floor, he goes 246 toothpicks and there's 246 toothpicks or a pail of peas. They can tell you exactly how many peas there are. They did some research at the at the university in university in Australia, where what they do is they magnetically stimulate the left side of the brain. They shut down the the left frontal cortex of the brain, and it's the same thing. You're shutting down that brain, and they put dots on a screen, and they tell the kid, "Okay, how many dots are on the screen?" He looks and he goes, uh, "I don't know, 100, 150." He has no idea. Then they magnetically stimulate, and like a savant, 
savants can do this with the with the toothpicks he just looks and he goes 102 133 and they, they're only on the screen for one second and he goes from two to eight out of 20 correct just by this magnetic stimulation so we're starting to understand how to do this and it's all got to do with disassociation shutting down they say quieting the mind but it's not quieting the mind it's quieting the left left side the rational analytical ego brain or like remote viewing the, the top remote viewer and his name escapes me they asked him how do you do it you're the top guy he said you've got to shut down the ego mind that's the whole deal it's it's this ingo is swan is that who you're talking about? what's that i'm sorry i didn't mean to interrupt you ingo swan is that who you no, were it was, uh, joe mcmonagle i believe and joe mcmonagle ah. i believe had a near-death experience that's how it was triggered with him and there's a lot of people when you take a look how many people their events started after a near-death experience or after a kundalini experience or something like that or Absolutely. even I started to think in the um, when you have the aliens on board the ship, um, you start looking at this fact that the people are just petrified. That's disassociation. It's almost like as if they're doing this on purpose because people will see the screen. 39% of all experiencers uh, will say, they'll, they'll have an experience. I'll say, did you see the screen? They'll say, yeah, I saw the screen. The screen is this thing they show you on board the ship and it's this environmental devastation. The world is nuclear devastation or flood or fire or all this sort of stuff. And a lot of experiences believe that they're testing our emotions. And I'm going, well, I mean, they've uh -huh. been for a million years. They must know what emotions are. And I say, maybe they're just trying to force that person to dissociate because that makes you more psychic because almost all um, people are uh, who have um, have had the abduction experience will have like 40% of them say they can heal. Uh, piles of them will say they, they have pre premonitions and it all starts with this event. And I believe there's some sort of disassociation that's happening there that forces them to be sort of psychic or whatever their talent is. This is a highly speculative question, but yeah. I'm wondering if these downloads, as you refer to them, and I think it's good terminology, if these downloads or these uh, contact events do you think that there's a chance that some of this information or the act of this contact itself could trigger some kind of change or release of information that might be stored in our DNA? Well, I'm about to do an experiment. I can give you a little hint on the experiment. I'm about to do an experiment. I'm doing a, an experiment with trans channelers. And what I'm going to say, it's been done once and we're trying to duplicate it, is that with a trans channeler, when you take the DNA, when the person is normal, uh, they will have one DNA when they channel whatever the entity is, whatever the being is, the DNA will completely change, which means that it's, it's going out of the, the, the idea. Is it a world made of consciousness or is it a world made of nuts and bolts? And what the idea is, and Jay-Z Knight was the one that did the first experiment that worked, was that she was told that the, the, the mind is the DNA. So that's how the material is passing. And whereas we think, you're a victim of your DNA, you've got your DNA, uh, whatever happens to you, happens to you. And again, it's this, extern it's this external thing that you control your DNA. We now know with ep epigenetics that, you, that your body is responding to things that are happening around you. But in terms of um, this whole thing, it's all consciousness. There is really no physical world. When you come down to quantum physics, I say when you get the dual slit experiment, you, get, you have the quantum wave potentials and once the observer appears, the particle appears on the back wall. There is no particle on the back wall until there's an observer. Whereas in the, in the modern world, we believe that the particles are on the back wall. All the particles gathered together. They made a brain and the brain made the observer. No, the observer is there before the particle. And that's the whole thing of trying to keep it in, in perspective that the, um, the consciousness is primary and we're making these mistakes of believing there's a physical world which creates consciousness. You know, that's beautiful. I was going to ask you about that, and, and you, you said that, and so that helps me segue. Do you think that that's the only real tangible key we have within the realm of traditional science, the blind uh, slit, the double slit experiment, uh, and the fact that a conscious observer changes the results of the test? Do you think that that's absolute evidence of this principle at work? Well, they still argue it. They'll still say... Um you know, that, that there, there's a way, there, there's this promissory science that will explain this and they'll they'll have all sorts of sort of alternate explanation. I think it's pretty solid, but it hasn't really convinced the materialists 
uh, to shift yet. I think this DNA experiment, and I have the, the top, one of the, the top trans channeler in the world who has temporarily agreed to do this. Um, and if this gets duplicated, uh, as I say, and I had a proposal paper, I tried to get a bunch of people to do this and nobody really wanted to do it. I had some channelers and it, you don't want to, you don't want a relay channeler. You don't want somebody who's sort of talking to a, a dead person or an alien or whatever. And it's sort of like, he tells me this, I'm telling you this, and you're just passing the messages. You need someone who's actually like a possession where the, where the entity takes over the body. Uh, and I said in my proposal paper, if this works, if we duplicate this Jay-Z Knight test, we are no longer in Kansas. Everything changes because a lot of DNA people pick it up. Uh, they sort of know that this, they don't know what I'm doing, but they know there's an experiment going on. And if it works, well, then uh, everything changes and it's duplicatable that you can actually run this test with these trans channelers or with my, I believe the same thing would happen with multiple personality disorder people that when the altar comes in, uh, who's writing with a different hand and is a different sex and uh, one is homosexual one is heterosexual stuff like that i think you're going to see some changes in dna there and that sort of changes the whole idea because the, the the thing you're trying to overcome is this the idea that we're just biological robots in a random meaningless universe and this i think is one of the best experiments i've seen to prove now if it doesn't work i'm gonna have to walk it back but right now i absolutely think it's going to work because you do take you look at these trans channelers who will their, everything changes, their voice changes, their uh, their impression changes, uh, their eye color will change. Uh, same with multiple personality people. Their, uh, you know, their eye color will change, their glasses will change, they'll have different prescriptions. Uh, all sorts of things change that indicate that DNA is changing. And that sort of gives us the, the impression that the idea that we're just biological robots and, and we have this uh, DNA, that we're a victim of our DNA and whatever it happens, happens. Uh, I think if that gets overthrown, then uh, we have to start going to this idea, is the world built out of consciousness? And and that's uh, in in the, there's more people believing it now. In 2013, when, when I made my first lecture on consciousness, um, um, I, I was sort of ostracized in the UFO community, but you can see more and more people now as we go along who are starting to realize there's something to this consciousness thing, that it, this is not just crazy stuff, that there, there's something to this. Whereas in 2012, it was still a pretty crazy idea. Do you think that within this context, within this framework that you're laying out, do you think that that fundamentally, um, what is the word, uh, uh, redefines disclosure and what disclosure means in the sense that disclosure uh, through the realm of consciousness is already present or there to be perceived. And it is up to us to uh, shift our awareness, to become aware of that. And, and that disclosure, quote unquote, is really this act of consciousness rather than a headline that's going to show up in a newspaper or UFOs hanging out over, uh, you know, the White House. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a little bit of both because I say bo whether you're talking about the government or whether you're talking about whatever this intelligence is, uh, neither is revealing. They're, they're, it, to disclose is to reveal. So they're doing a slow reveal, and but they're not, the government's not going to stand up and say, it's for real, here's an alien, whatever, not in the near future. The same, but the, but the aliens, ETs, intelligence, whatever, they're doing the same thing. If they wanted to land and tell us what's going on, they would land and tell us what's going on. But they're, they're not covering up because if the, um, if the government wanted to cover up, they would just shut up. Like I come from Canada. I have no idea what the Canadian government's doing. No idea. 40 years I've been here. I, I've studied for 40 years. They just don't talk about it. So I don't know what they're doing. So, um, but the, the aliens of the intelligence is doing the same thing. They're not telling us what's going on. They're not covering up because if they wanted to cover up, they would just turn the lights off on the craft. Why do UFOs have lights on them? So you can see them. We don't have lights on our craft. They put lights on so you can see them. They drop crop circles. They're, dry, they're doing these little breadcrumbs, uh, ground traces, these pieces of metal that you've seen, these uh, uh, ports, things appearing, disappearing. All they're mm -hmm. doing is saying to you, something's going on, and you're going, crop circle, what's this crop circle? What's this about? What are these UFOs? And it's making you think, because the way we do it, and the way I describe it, is we go into Iraq and we say, we're here to bring you freedom, democracy, Jesus, and McDonald's. 
And they just exactly. put a gun at him and say, get the hell out of here. And and that's the whole thing is they're not using that technique. That technique never works. You can't take over. So what they're trying to do is this, this gradual awakening. And I believe the government's doing the same thing. They may have learned it from the beings, but they're doing this same sort of gradual thing where you have to come to the conclusion. So when you come to the conclusion that it's for real, nobody's changing your mind. And it's one person at a time. And you can see this sort of going. And it's almost like I say the UFO community is no different than any other social or political movement, whether it's gay rights, African-American rights or gay marriage. It's like I say to you, OK, so when did African-Americans get sort of the rights to be equal? And you go, I don't know, it was back, I don't know, 30 years, 40 years ago. And there is no real date. It'll just your consciousness will rise and then they'll just suddenly flip and everybody will go, yeah, we know there's aliens. I mean, what's the big deal? And that's that's I think the. The, the catch to the whole thing is it's it's this gradual acclimatization that both the government and the intelligence behind the phenomena are conducting. That makes sense. I like that. I like that uh, point of view on that. That's uh, it's thought provoking. Um, so do you think in terms of our perception of what's going on, a big missing piece of the puzzle, uh, perhaps there are some scientists like if there's uh, scientists or organizations that have uh, recovered craft or are um, reverse engineering uh, technology that's alien technology. Do you think that the missing piece of the puzzle for us is that this technology works in association with alien consciousness and that's why we can't quite figure out you know like you know the, they don't they don't no one lives long enough to travel a hundred light years or you know what I mean the, yeah. to traverse those kinds of distances is consciousness really kind of the the tech the missing technological key to all of this absolutely that's when you start that's where I say you'll never understand the UFO phenomena unless you get into consciousness because what you have is two different things uh, one I'm I've, I've got a book that's three quarters finished and then I got sort of another topic but it's it's got to do with portals and it's got to do with what's called mission mission rama it's a group that started in peru in 1974 and these people are sort of able to open what they call zendras which are like portals where uh he's gone again wow wow i don't want to i don't want to make much ado about nothing <laughs> I don't want to, you know, the rational explanation is that he's in, uh, he's in uh, Manitoba. He's in Winnipeg, Manitoba. And uh, this is a, an international connection, although in the digital world, I'm not sure what, how much of a factor distance is. But uh, here we are on this deep subject, and he gets, keeps getting cut off. Uh, I find it interesting. But I'm not. Uh, I'm not going to stick my neck out, and and you know, I was kind of joking earlier. I'm not. I'm not going to say that. Uh, hey, the NSA is trying to interfere with this conversation. Um, but I find this unusual uh, in any respect. Um, and I, like I said, I have not had any other guest just disappear, like just be there and mid sentence, just like that, be gone. I have not uh, experienced this on this show yet. Whenever there has been some kind of interference with a guest, their image, at least from my perspective, their image freezes and you don't hear any audio or sometimes the image is choppy and like I said, there's some latency there. And, uh, and then sometimes there's some latency with the aud audio and then it kind of catches up to itself and, and gets back in place. But I have never had anyone just disappear mid-sentence three times in one show. This is unprecedented. And, uh, of course, there can be a rational uh, explanation for this that's uh, based in technology or whatever. Um, you know, once I'm willing to buy the technical thing, twice eh, maybe we have a bad connection maybe there's something going on here three times like that i'm starting to get suspicious i don't know about you but uh i'll keep talking and i'll see if mr cameron returns and i do plan on asking him about ron pandol pandolfi's man bun so uh the adversary do not uh do not despair i will ask and and i'm 
catching up to my uh, chat here. I see Pat Breeze out of mind, uh, the professor, of course. Uh, Grant and Cheryl Costa together, William Pullen are all three. Yeah, no, that would be great. And I appreciate everyone that's in here. And I'm going to um, promote the trip to Area 51 that we're going to do uh, towards the end of March. Once again, uh, we still have everyone on board uh, at this time. If it changes, I'll let you know. But it's Rex Bear in alphabetic order. Again, alphabetical order. Rex Bear, Kelly Farmer, Heidi Gad, Michael Moriarty of Pursuing X, myself and Doc Skinner. We're going to be going to the gate of Area 51 up in the desert north of Las Vegas. And uh, we don't really think that we're going to be collecting evidence. I don't think any of us think that we're going to go up there and just because we show up and turn on a camera that we're going to get UFO footage. But I think we're going to pay homage to the uh, date, March 22nd, when um, Roger, uh, <laughs> Roger Lear, it's not Roger Lear, when uh, John Lear uh, and Bob Lazar and I believe George Knapp um, went up there and got the famous uh, footage, March 22nd. Uh, that would have been 1989, 30 years ago. So um, we're going to go up there and we're going to do some episodes and we're going to have fun. And Mr. Cameron is back. <laughs> Welcome back, sir. Yeah, I don't remember where I left off. This is, I'm very sorry this is happening, but anyway. Oh, no, no. I, I, there, one thing's for sure this isn't your fault. So yeah. uh, if it, uh, yeah. I, I appreciate it though. So let I me appreciate the fact that you keep coming back, but keep going. Yeah. Uh, let's just do the quickly the consciousness thing because I did. A, did I mention the flying the ship? Fourteen percent of all experiencers say they've flown the ship. No, I was getting ready to ask you about that. Okay. Yeah, fourteen percent say they've flown the ship, and I've have I have fifty people that I've talked to, and I've got a lot of them on tape, and basically it's like they're reading off a cue card. They all say the same thing. You go onto the craft, you put your hand on a round ball on a beehive or you put your hand on a flat panel. There is no steering wheel. Even um, Cat Stevens, the famous musician, uh, before he became Muslim was talking about the fact that he had been abducted and he wrote a song called Freezing Steel. I was on the house, the house of freezing steel, the house without the uh -huh. guiding wheel. And there is no wheel. You put your hand on the panel and the craft, everybody says the same thing. I suddenly realized the craft was alive. I became one with the craft. And whatever I thought is what the craft did. So if you want to go to another star system, you just think it and the craft does whatever you want it to do. So this is the importance of the, the mental link. There's no way you can get around this, that the people on board, I have never, none of the 50 people have ever said anything but the fact that they flew the craft with their mind. And I've got a lot of people that I've, I've interviewed about this. Wow. that That's incredible. Um, that, that, I just find it, Absolutely fascinating. Um, have you ever considered uh, participating in hypnotic regression to see if you can dig deeper within your within your own mind? Uh, I tried it one. I would tried it one time with a, a Newton regression. I'm very much into the Michael Newton thing. I tried that, and they I, I failed at uh, you know didn't get my two hundred fifty dollars worth. So I, I've tried it. <laughs> But uh, that is a way. That's one of the contact modalities. Like I'm speaking in LA um, at Consciousness Life Expo, and I'm doing okay. the 75 contact modalities. So I go through all the different ways, and uh, hypnosis is one way that you can. And it's the idea is how do you get out of this conscious uh, mind of yours and tap into the field to pop into the field? And there's I've got 75 different ways that that people can tap into the field. Can we talk a little bit, this is shifting gears slightly, but this kind of ties in, and you made a reference to Cat Stevens. Um, when you wrote your book, Tuned In, The Paranormal World of Music, can you discuss a little bit maybe how these downloads may work with uh, popular music or uh, creative works of art and popular culture and how that's being expressed? Well, I think that um, there's two, I guess, well, there's a couple of factors. One would be that a lot of the musicians that I dealt with in my book were the 60s, 70s and stuff. And they, a lot of them are doing LSD. And uh, <laughs> that's like, that's going into the field with a rocket on your backside. I mean, you're in the field, even if you don't want to be in the field, you're going in the field. So that's they had shit. that <laughs> awakening. And the other thing that a lot of musicians are right brained. Like, I have in the book how many musicians cannot read and write music. It's unbelievable. And so the Beatles, the Stones, I mean, it's like all the top musicians, a lot of them could not read or write music. So um, musicians are very right-brained. Uh, they're very, um, 
um, they're very creative. And if you look at the the guy who did the alien, um, uh, Roger Lear, who did the implant stuff, taking the implants out in Los Angeles, he did yes. 17 operations. He was asked, what's common between all ab abductees? And he said, number one, they're all right brain creative people. And number two, all implants are on the left side of the body because your right side, your right brain right, runs your left side of your body and vice versa. So all the implants are on the left side of the body, according to Roger Lear, which means they're not interested in your left brain. If they put an implant in you, they're interested in your right brain. That's where you tap in. So that was the thing with musicians. And a lot of musicians, I had like 150 musicians who had uh, uh, songs in dreams, uh, uh, instantaneous songs that came like within a, within a couple of seconds or five minutes, the song just came into their head, almost like this idea. And that the way I got into that was when I had the download experience, I was so blown away by this download experience. I said, I, I, I Google searched download and it came up with Paul McCartney's song yesterday that came in the middle of the night in a, when, when he woke up and then I learned the one about uh, let it be where McCartney is, um, has a dream where his mother, whose name was Mary comes to him at the time when the Beatles were breaking up and said, it'll be okay, let it be. And that's where this, the lyrics come from. In times of trouble, Mother Mary, who died, his mother died when he was 14 years old. Mother Mary comes to me speaking words of wisdom, let it be. And so when I started getting this, I started to get all these musicians and I went, wow, all these musicians are getting these, these, these downloads the same as I got them. And so I was gonna do the book on music, but then it turned, I realized there were savants, there was artists, there was um, uh, psychedelic people, near-death experiences. And I, I started to realize there's only all these contact modalities. It wasn't just musicians who were getting downloads. There was all these people who were getting it from various things. And we sort of think that, you know, uh, it, that people are rationally figuring stuff out. And when you come right down to it, it's like, no, a lot, a lot of the major discoveries, the, the theory of relativity, the quantum atom, the laser, the hologram, uh, the sewing machine, all these things came in downloads and you start to realize like these people are tapping in. So it's not that they're, that all the material is there. All the inventions are there. All the material is there. And it's the ability of these people to tap in. And a lot of people will actually describe it. They only tapped in one time and they're still trying to figure out, boy, I wish you could do that again. They got some major invention and they can't do it anymore. They, they did it one time. So it's that whole, it's that disassociation thing and musicians are able to dissociate. So that's where it came down. But then it turned into a book called Inspired because I realized I got all oh, this is more musicians and I have a chapter on all sorts of different, uh, different people who were getting these download things and realized that this is pretty common and that a lot of the stuff we have did not come from, from here. It came from someplace else and the person got it. They put it in there. They got the patent. They made millions of dollars, but it didn't come from them. It came from someplace else. Wow. Um, <laughs> it's just fascinating. I, I want to jump back a little bit. Yeah. Do you think that maybe not all, but some UFO uh, phenomena or even other paranormal uh, phenomena, do you think that it's not a physical presence, but a projection of consciousness from these beings, kind of like a conscious projection of a hologram? Well, again, we we'll go back to the download. Is it a world made of nuts and bolts or is it a world made of consciousness? It's all consciousness. So they okay. can come in, they can manifest into the physical world and become physical, but they're, they live in the other world. For example, Bashar, who is the, the, one of the most famous channelers in the world. Uh, when he was, to, when Bashar comes across like Daryl Anka, he's channeling Bashar. Bashar comes across and Bashar says, and a lot of people will tell me this. I, I've never been abducted but they come in my dreams all the time. I get them in dreams. And Bashar says, we come to you in your dreams because now you're in our world. And that's the whole idea. And that's where I learned that thing is they're all out there and they, they will be a spiritual being or, or some people um, who have been abducted have actually asked a question. One woman actually, her name is Sherry Wild, who if you've never interviewed is a fantastic interview. And huh. she has a movie deal that maybe come off. She's got this book, whatever dramatic story, very distressed by her, her abduction experience through her whole life. But she, at one point, the, the being she was dealing with, his name was Da. And she said to Da, she said, are you actually an alien? And he said, no, not really. And she said, well, why do you come as this ugly looking gray thing? And he said, ugly looking gray thing. Have you ever looked in the mirror? When you look at, when you, when you, when you, when you, when, when you smile at us, we think you're going to eat us. She has these big teeth when she smiles, she got big teeth. And, and mm -hmm. so, 
this is the whole idea is that maybe it's not aliens. They can project themselves. And there's even a theory that you, whatever alien you see will determine is, is determined by your manifestation, what you bring into it. So if you're a very fearful person, you're going to see great. Right. If you're into sex and, and you've got a high drive, you're going to see reptilians. If you're very religious, you're going to see more like a uh, ghost type figure, angelic. And there was even a debate between Bud Hopkins, who believed that the aliens were all intruders, they were bad guys, uh -huh. and John Mack, the, 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 from Harvard University, the psychiatrist, and they're having a debate one time. And John Mack believed this was a, a good phenomena, that people were learning, it was your, your uh, shadow figure that was trying to teach you stuff and stuff like that. And so Bud says to him, John, isn't it funny how I get all the bad ones and you get all the good ones? And, he's, and then so John, John Mack says, well, bud, perhaps that has more to do with you and I than it does with the aliens. And this is this whole thing that people don't realize. Are you projecting? Are you manifesting what you think? People think that, again, they think it, it's internal. There's these external things that don't change. And the whole thing, the number one message, I believe, of whatever phenomena you're dealing with in the, in the field, the number one message is oneness and love. Absolutely. It's this whole idea that if you absolutely believe that you are one with the universe, if you believe that the that the air is your lungs, that the trees are the, the trees are your lungs, the air is your breath, that the water is your 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 circulation. If you realize that you're one with everything, then how can I steal your stuff? How can I kill you? We're all if you actually believe that and that I believe is the number one message that they're trying to tell us is you have to understand that you are like a cell in a body that we all are working towards one thing. And the minute you have ego gets in the way that you say, I'm just going to keep duplicating. I'm going to be special. That's called a cancer cell. And that's the message I believe they're trying to get. 54% um, of all experiencers say on board the ship, they were talked to about oneness and love. That is the key message. And once we understand that, then the wars will stop. And I say categorically that you cannot have evil unless you have a belief in separation. The minute you believe that you and I are different or that object is different, I can destroy the, the plants, I can destroy the animals because I'm not, I'm not connected to them. They're just objects. We have to understand we're all one. We're like, a, like cells in a body. That we are like one planet and the whole thing, it all works together. And once you understand that, you understand the concept. I think that they're trying to get across to us. That's why they're here. Because in 1945, we detonated the atomic bomb and they realized the kids have got the matches and these people believe in separation and they're all going to kill each other with these nuclear weapons. And that's when they came in and they shut down nuclear weapons and they started to give these messages to people about love and oneness and and hopefully the message gravitates up and consciousness flips before we destroy ourselves but even if we do destroy ourselves if it's one world one life multiple lives even if we destroy the world it really doesn't matter because you and i are going to keep coming around until we learn our lessons we just go to a different planet we learn something el elsewhere in the end it comes down to only one thing to me you came into this world if it's multiple lives you came into this world to do something you plan something and when you leave the world, you're only going to get asked one question. How did it work out? Because you and I both planned our lives. You can't blame Hillary and Trump and, uh, you know, your mother-in-law and all these right. other, they're going to go time out. This is about you. You planned this. How did it work out? And so all you have to worry about is why did I choose to come into the world? What did I choose to do? And am I doing it? You don't have to worry about what anybody else is doing. It doesn't matter what anybody else is doing. It only matters what I have. And because you and I have, extra knowledge we have insight as to what's going on i was raised to be a, a minister so i was very much into uh one Bi bible passage says too much is given much is expected and edgar casey who i followed before i got into ufos said knowledge not used to sin so you and i are actually in a worse position than the idiot on the street who doesn't know what's going on you and i have knowledge and so it comes down to the end you're not, you can't say, well, you know, if I had got disclosure, I would have done something. If my mother, had, you know, and no, no, you had the knowledge. You decided to come in. All we have to do is figure out what are you and I here to do? And are we doing it? Nothing else matters. Understood. Do you think an oversimplified way to state this would be that this left brain functioning, the rational brain, is what breaks things down into duality and categorization? Exactly. Where right, where right brain creativity is what allows us to see the unity of everything and, and have the direct experience of oneness. Not an abstract concept, 
but a direct conscious experience Absolutely. of unity within the universe. You and and that's it. why that that's it. You, you spelled it out. That's exactly what it is. It's the left brain that gives you the idea of separation, that the ego, that I am an ego, I am separate from you. And the whole thing is like psychedelics. People who take high dose, like this hero dose of, of psychedelics, suddenly say, yeah. my ego was crushed. And I suddenly realized everything was alive and conscious. That's the real world. And, but you need the ego to be in the in the physical world. But when the ego gets gets uh, away with itself, then you have like a suicide. Suicide is the ego wins. I felt sorry ah. for myself. I'm in the middle of this thing, and the ego. When when you and I play our egos, that you're going to fight with me, and we're we're separate objects going after each other. That's the whole thing. But that's left brain, and the, with the contact modalities, what I'm hoping I can get across is that you can shut that down. We now know how to do this and we understand the importance of shutting the left brain down in order to get the material if you want to get it. If you want to live just a life where you're putting your kids in soccer practice and paying the bills, then you go with the ego mind. But the ego mind, because it believes in you versus me, we if unless we understand this, we will destroy the world. There's absolutely no doubt about it. We're heading in that direction. And that's what the whole thing is. They're trying to change the consciousness to this idea, almost like a female uh, uh, understanding, a right brain thing where you realize that you're all linked. And unless you do, it's game over. We are we are going to destroy ourselves. There's no way we're gonna get around it. Do you think that love is an actual energy, a psychic or conscious energy that transcends the emotional definition of love that we tend yes. to think of? Most of the people who had the near-death experiences or who had the Samadhi experience will say, this unconditional love. I I, can't, I I was I didn't want to come back. It was this uh, unbelievable thing. So in the the download I got was there's love and the absence of love is fear. If you don't if you don't understand the love, you have the fear. The same as there's no such thing as as darkness. Darkness is not a thing unto itself. Darkness is just the absence of light. The farther you get away from the light, the darker it gets. But darkness is not a thing. It's it's so there's only light and there's only there's only uh, love. And when you cut yourself off by ego away from that, you think you're in a different world. You think you're in a world of darkness, of evil, uh, of fear and stuff like that. And you control that. You, you can shut off the fear. You can shut off the darkness and you can go into the field, the Samadhi. You can have the Samadhi experience and you can understand that everything's connected. Everything's quiet. Everything. You have unconditional love. That is how the, that's the basis of the universe. And the whole duality of the mind is just for you to experience. So I don't really believe there's good or bad, good or bad people. I believe there's just souls reincarnating and that you have this, these events that, that teach you things and people will only want the good events. But when you, when you get the trauma things, you realize that the things that happen to you that are bad are the things that actually teach you things, and that pain comes for a reason. If you don't have pain, you're going to keep walking around with cancer until you drop over dead. You have pain for a reason. All these things, we've misinterpreted these things that every. Damn it. That's the only word I have for that. Damn it. Oh my God. Four times dropped out. <sighs> well, I'm going to wait for him to come back. I'm going to wrap up the interview when he comes back, but I hesitate to just uh, cut this short uh, and not really have any closure on this conversation. So uh, I'll wait for him to come back and we'll wrap it up. And uh, man, this is unbelievable. This is good stuff. I hope you're enjoying this episode, by the way. And uh, as if I need to remind you, please uh, like, oh, he's back. Please like and subscribe and share. Mr. Cameron, please. Yeah, I was on a roll there. I was on you a roll. Were. You were. You were cruising. <laughs> yeah, I, I, could talk, I could talk very fast, which I always say to people. If you think the brain is actually running the show, I talk very fast and I say, if you actually think that there are neurons running around in my head, putting words into sentences, and then there's some little uh, neuron that that's, uh, spell, you know, checks the grammar and the accent and all this sort of stuff, this is crazy stuff. I mean, it's coming from somewhere else. Consciousness is not part of the body and the brain is just this sort of like a sender receiver. There is no football game inside the TV in order, in other words. Correct. So do you think that um, this ties in directly with Carl Jung's concept of the collective unconscious, 
But uh, with new information and our own intellectual evolution uh, in conjunction with technology, that this is uh, kind of the same thing, except perhaps more uh, uh, comprehensibly uh, understood. Or, or now we have um, the analogy of computers and, and digital technology to help us understand this concept better. But in essence, it's the same thing. Yeah. As the yeah. yeah. Everybody uses different words. The other part of the download I got is, is it a noun or a verb? And I always try to stay away from the words. Like I call it the field. But I try to stay from the away from the words because what we do is because the ego and the, the, the our material mind wants to put everything as a noun. So there's like people say there's these different levels of, of, of dimensions. I go, there's no levels. There's, it's all this. It's all one thing. And you try to give an analogy. So you say it's collective unconscious. It's, uh, you know, uh, the field. It's the Akashic field. It's, uh, you know, non-local consciousness, whatever it is. But it is the same concept. That was just the, the word that he used for it. Okay, we're going to uh, start to wind this down. I do have, this is a, a light hearted question. I have someone, I, and I, I take it that this person may know you, or at least are extremely uh, familiar with your work. This person in the chat room is called The Adversary, and he wanted me to ask you what you think of Ron Pandolfi's man bun. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know, I know who you're talking about. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, well, Ron's a kind of a weird guy. I've, I've followed him around. I've chased him around for 20 years. Uh, he's never threatened me. I've written some, you know, pretty, you know, outlandish things about him or pretty direct about who he is. And I mean, he's supposed, supposedly the top scientist in the CIA and the guy that runs the CIA UFO Weird Desk. And uh, he has some pretty bizarre things. And I, I'm not sure whether he does all this stuff just to uh direct direct the attention away from himself that everybody thinks he's crazy i think he's not crazy i think he's uh he's a strange character but very very smart guy so that's basically and i, I don't know why you want the man bunny he's like 60 years old or whatever he's like why he did it? his wife is like 20 years younger than him maybe that's what it was all about <laughs> or his it new one the second wife right so um, as we uh, go to wrap this up, what new projects are you working on that you would like to tell people about? Or can you talk about where you're going to be making approaches to do lectures and talks? Uh, well, I'm basically going to stop lectures for a while. I'm doing Consciousness Life Expo, which is the one where I'm going to do the 75 contact modalities, which is a very major uh, presentation. I've worked on it for a couple of months. I think I'm sort of on the leading edge of this. And then I'm going to do that in a... Um, in an online thing that'll probably run for three or four hours where I'll get into detail on every one of these contact modalities. How do you tap into the field? How do you talk to an alien? How do you do this kind of stuff? So I'm doing that. I'm bringing out, um, I wrote the book called Managing Magic, which talks about Ron Pandolfi and Tom DeLonge and sort of stuff. I'm bringing out Beyond Managing Magic. And I'm not getting anywhere because I'm so down rabbit holes researching. I'm not really, it's, it's gotta be edited and stuff, but I'm going to drop a document that is going to basically confirm this thing's for real. And it's just another government program. And uh, it's the most dramatic thing I've seen in 40 some years. Uh, when I saw it, I just couldn't believe what this was. So I'm going to drop it. I'm going to kill the, the providence of it. I'm going to take all the names out of it because uh, I'm not 100% sure it's, it's real, but it will reveal a lot of stuff about the government and what the government's doing. Those are two major things uh, I'm going to do uh and the that and i mentioned this experiment that if this experiment works uh where we do trans channelers and the dna changes then um that will probably lead to a whole new field of of chasing that that sort of discovery but that's what i'm doing i'm still the basically the consciousness thing and i i want to get out of the disclosure things so i'm going to do this one more book and hopefully I can get out of it because I've written about four books on disclosure and I hate it. It's, I call it the rat hole story. The consciousness <laughs> is the rabbit hole story. That's where you've got to go. It really doesn't matter what, what the government knows, who's covering it up, what they know. It really doesn't matter. It's, it's figuring out how reality works. And that's where consciousness goes. You start to understand how does the, how does the universe actually work? Yeah. Wow. I, I just want to thank you for such a great conversation. You make such salient points and uh, you're, you're so well-spoken. I really appreciate that. And I want to preemptively invite you to please come back on the show anytime you'd like to 
But also yeah. after you drop this document or after you get some results from your uh, experiment, please yeah. come back and let's discuss because uh, okay. from my point of view, this was a wonderful conversation. One of the best that we've had on this show. And I truly would love to have you back. And I appreciate you taking the time to be with us here tonight. Okay. Next time I will be at home. I'm, I'm actually not at home right now. So next time I'll have a cable, I'll plug the cable in and, and clear the cache and do all that sort of stuff that hopefully we can stay on uh, full time. So I really appreciate your interest and uh, I'd be honored to come back and do it again. Thank you so much, Grant Cameron. Thank you. I appreciate it. And now we're going to have what? The happy music. The happy. And uh, we're going to roll it out. <laughs> and uh, thank you for watching. Uh, like, subscribe, share, all of that stuff. And uh, get some other people to like and share. And I'm up to uh, way well over 300 subscribers. And that's not possible without you, the viewer, the listener, the subscriber. Thank you so much. Uh, Jimmy and Mika, Kelly Farmer, Doc Skinner. Uh, let's see. Uh, Rex Bear. Uh, who else do I have? Uh, Heidi Gad. Hello. Uh, Jiggy from Paranormal Hood. I just want to shout out to all you folks. CW Chanter, we're talking. CW is going to come back. And uh, Mark Gemini Thwaite, we almost post production done on that. Uh, so look for that. It's going to be awesome. You did a great interview. Thank you so much. William Pullen will be back on. We're going to do our topic and look for us. Same bat time, same bat channel next week. Thank you, everyone, and good night.